Well, good morning. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. I wanted to come up dressed like Apollo Creed and Apollo F and Rocky IV, but that was vetoed. <laughs> this is just me today. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we are continuing on in our, our sermon series on paradox, as you saw. Uh, it is uh, this idea that we are living in a in a world uh, that perhaps sometimes calls us. Uh, wants us, because culture desires conformity, wants us to live in a way that runs counter to the way in which Christ has called us to live. It's not all the time. Culture's not bad. But sometimes we kind of get feel this tension, this conflict. And it seems like the way that Christ calls us to do something seems to be not the best way to do it. And so we enter this paradox, this, this tension-filled uh, sort of state. And today we're talking about uh, uh, integrity in the age of duplicity. Now, duplicity is not always a bad thing. I have been a singles minister my entire time I've been at Park Cities, and duplicity is something I actively encourage. When a couple gets engaged and you're going, or you're going into the proposal, the proposal is all about duplicity. You want to fool that girl into thinking nothing important is going to happen tonight. And then, bam, you're on your knee, you got a ring in your hand, and she's blown away, there's tears... Lots of tears. This apparently has not happened to anybody before. But no, it's so funny. We're all like honesty and authenticity in marriage. But when it comes to a proposal, lie to her. Blatantly. Duplicity is also something that takes place in military affairs. You want to fool your enemy. You want to trick your enemy into thinking that the attack is coming from one where is it coming somewhere else. One of the most famous examples of this was in World War II, right before the invasion of Normandy. The Germans figured that George Patton was going to lead the invasion force because he was uh, what they thought was the best general that the Americans had, that the Allies had. And so the Allies took advantage of this. They created a fake army. They made a fake army. Uh, they sent communications. They leaked things through double agents. And the Germans believed that George Patton was leading an army that didn't exist, that was going to invade at uh, the closest point between England and France. They even made like wooden uh, tanks and put them on the coast of England. And so when German spy planes flew over, they saw all this military buildup and there was nothing there. Duplicity was a great thing. But here's the funny thing. When you're on the receiving end of duplicity, when you're the one being fooled, when you're the one being tricked, it's not so fun. It's not something that you enjoy. And to go through your life or to go through a season thinking one thing, believing one thing, and then to actually believe something else, find out it was a lie the whole time. It's one of those heartbreaking things in the world. I believe that we have an enemy. His name is Satan, and I'm not somebody that goes and finds the devil under every rock, but we do have an enemy. And he works in duplicity, and he's working on tricking us and fooling us all the time. So how would we know? How would we know if we've been tricked? How would we know if we've been fooled? We're going to talk about that uh, today, this morning. So we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll, we'll, we'll break it apart. Uh, verse 1 says this, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the insecure, insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So we're going to talk about two things today. We're going to talk about the peril of deceit and then the power of integrity. So let's talk about the peril of deceit. So we moved on in the letter uh, from Paul to Timothy. Uh, the first part is kind of, Timothy, this is how you're going to deal with the church. This is what's going on in the church. This is how we're going to address. The second half, starting here in, in chapter 4, is, okay, Timothy, directly, this is what I'm telling you. This is what's going on. And one of the things that Paul does here, it's really cool, is he connects Timothy's local struggle with the larger sort of cosmic battle between good and evil. This is why he brings in words like the Spirit expressly says. In later times, demons... He's reminding Timothy, hey, 
You're not this localized, cut off from the rest of what's going on. What's going on in Ephesus is a big deal. It's a part of, it's just one front, it's one battle in a larger multi-front war that has been spanning generations of God's people. It started in the Garden of Eden, and the war has blossomed and grown from then going forward all the way through this church in Ephesus, and we even deal with it today. And the church at Ephesus is struggling with false teaching. It's how this uh, war is manifest, this deceit is manifesting itself in Timothy's life. And the key is that this isn't happenstance. This isn't an accident. These are intentional, decisive strokes by a cunning strategist designed to pull people away from the faith designed to disrupt people's life, designed to get you to believe lies, to harm the worship of God. Jesus calls Satan in in, uh, the book of John the father of lies. This is what he does. This is his strategy. This is how he functions to get us to believe lies, duplicity, which means whenever the church encounters duplicity, falsehoods, lies, it's a part of a bigger fight. This is why when we see untrustworthiness in church leadership or why we wrangle over over, uh, seemingly minor issues, it's why we think that I don't need to go to church right now. I I I don't have to be around God's people. Those are all instances of somebody somewhere believing a falsehood or a lie. But on the other hand, it's not just a corporate problem. It's an individual one. You encounter Satan's duplicity every single day of your life. You struggle with it. We hide our pain and suffering behind a smile so that people can't see us bleed. We hide our struggles and addictions so that people think we have it all together. We actually hide our real need for community behind a five-minute conversation that happens before our connect group or our small group. That's not community. That's small talk. That's not community. Not to mention the struggles that you face on a daily basis. At work, we fool our coworkers that we know more than we do. We fool our family that we're more okay than we are. And fool our friends, acting that we have it all together when we really don't. You see, duplicity is all over. And every time you climb out of bed in the morning, you are putting your boots in the sand of a foreign beach. And you're right back into the combat. You're right back into the fight. So what I want to do today is I want us to talk about what is Satan trying to accomplish? It's helpful when you're encountering an enemy to know what's their goal, what's their, what are they trying to do so that we can protect ourselves. We can defend those weak points, right? So there's three things that his deceit is trying to do that we're going to see in our passage today. One, deceit leads to desertions. Look at verse one. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. Now there's many ways in, in warfare to defeat an enemy. Most people think you inflict losses by combat, right? So bombs, bullets, spears, swords, shields, all that stuff. But there's another way that's sometimes more effective, and it's called attrition. Attrition is when you make it so hard to fight the war, you make it hard to get supplies, you make it difficult for them to to eat, you destroy their will to fight. You wear them down, and eventually... The soldiers will just take their weapons, drop them, and go home. People give up. The Russians have done this twice, both to Napoleon and to Hitler. They use this thing called winter. Yeah, it gets cold in Russia. Surprise. (laughs) To wear down the German army and the French army. uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant did this to Robert E. Lee in 1864. Robert E. Lee beat him numerous times in battles. But Grant was like, yeah, I've got more men than you do. I'm just going to keep coming. He could replace his losses. Lee could not. We did this to the British in the American Revolution. This is why we celebrate Independence Day. We made it so hard to fight us, they finally just gave up and said, yeah, it's not worth it. And I'm pretty sure the British still think that about us. (laughs) It's not worth it. Attrition can come from disease or starvation or running out of supplies, but one of the ways it shows up is your soldiers just drop their weapons and go home. The war gets so hard, they quit. And this is what this passage is talking about, except people aren't deserting an army. They're deserting the faith. 
Some people are going along, they're, they're following Jesus, and then they get duped. They get worn down, or they let their doubts, their fears, their suffering, their struggling overwhelm them to the point that they just quit. Jesus talks about this in one of his parables. It's the parable of the four soils. He says that a farmer goes out, and he's scattering seed, and the seed lands on four different kinds of soil. There's good soil, and then there's three others that aren't so good. And one of the ones he talks about is it falls among rocky soil. And the seed is the gospel. This is the promise of the hope that we have in Christ. And it springs up in the rocky soil. But as soon as difficulty comes, as soon as hard times come, it burns up and it withers and dies. People desert. They quit. They give up. We have this tendency when suffering comes to believe lies. And you know why that is? It's because we want to feel good. It's because we don't want to hurt. It's because we want to be comfortable. That is a normal, natural thing. And Satan takes advantage of it. And he starts feeding us lies. What we don't realize is that the true comfort, the true peace that we'll achieve is by following Christ through the suffering, not getting off at the first opportunity we have. Not quitting, not throwing down our faith and running away and going home. But we follow him, we continue on, we press on. In order to defeat This temptation to desert, we have to do what soldiers have done throughout history, is keep going, keep fighting. But when suffering and trials come to us, we often try to buy lies. Things like, God has it out for me, he's mad at me, he's punishing me. Or the lie that we did something wrong and God is is coming after me. Job dealt with this. He has three friends that are very good friends and tell him all the ways that he screwed up. Some of you have friends like that. And Job's like, no, that's not what's going on. Or the lie that God's never going to deliver us. He's never going to rescue us. And suffering makes those lies really believable, for whatever reason that is. So deceit often leads to desertion. It can also lead to defection. Deceit leads to defection. Look at verse 1 again, the end of verse 1. Some will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So in September of 1960, two NSA agents named William Martin and Vernon Mitchell took a vacation to Mexico. And from Mexico, they took a boat over to Havana, Cuba. And from Cuba, they caught a freighter to the Soviet Union. And the next time anybody saw them, they were on Soviet TV decrying American espionage policies and foreign policy. They had defected. They had switched sides. They had joined the Soviet Union. They become communists in a time when, when that was a big, big deal, right? This is one of the many cases of defection that took place in the Cold War. Most of them happened with the Eastern Bloc countries and uh, people coming to the West, but we had some people in the West go towards the East. And defections are dangerous. All this intelligence, all this uh, espionage, all this technological advancements go with the person, and so they think they're losing a military advantage. And the end of verse 1 and all of verse 2 talk about this second effect that duplicity has on people because it's not just a turning away It's not just quitting the faith. You then turn to something else. See, human beings have this problem. We can't not follow. People are followers. It's what they do. Now, you might think to yourself, I'm a trailblazer. I do my own path. I walk my own. Yeah, okay. Just like everybody else who said, I'm a trailblazer. I walk my own path, right? We all are conditioned to follow someone, right? It's not a bad thing. Some of us are conditioned to grow up in a certain way that our parents raised us. Some of us don't want to be anything like our parents, and so we're doing everything against that. Well, guess what? You're still following them. You're just following them as a negative example. Everybody is conditioned socially to dress a certain way. How many of you are wearing togas or capes? Anybody bringing capes back anytime soon? No. Why? Socially, we've been conditioned that togas aren't cool anymore. I would wager that they seem very comfortable to me, but whatever. (laughs) Human beings were made for worship. And if we aren't worshiping our creator, we'll start worshiping that which is created. And defections are a part of this. We defect to worshiping other things. Defections have been uh, things that armies have feared throughout history. It's why they punish them with executions, typically. If you switch sides, that's, that's a big deal. A defection is even a central part of Jesus' story. One of his followers, Judas, joins the other team. He joins the religious leaders in bringing Jesus down. Defections are a big deal. And Jesus tells us again in the parable of the four soils. He says, 
Some, soil, some, some seed was spread on ground that has thorns, and it grew up, but the thorns choked out the good plants, the good seeds, before they could bear fruit. And the thorns are the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. You see, this is ultimately why people defect from the faith or from their country or from whatever. They think the grass is greener on the other side. They think that life will be better, things will be better over there than they are here. But remember, people defect long before in their heart. They defect long before they ever change their address. Martin and Mitchell, they were Soviets long before they ever left the country, long before they ever went to Mexico. They said that they bought pop propaganda uh, from the Soviet Union. They, they start to, started to believe it. Their location didn't matter as much as to who they became. And this is why verse 3, if you look at it, it ends with uh, describing who actually uh, gives thanksgiving. Thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. People that believe internally, people that are followers of Christ inside and out. Is that you? Are you a follower of Jesus inside and out? Or are you just an external follower of Christ? And a long time ago, you gave up. You defected to another kingdom. You defected and followed something else. Followed maybe self-centeredness or a different philosophy, or a different way of life. You come to church, you come to your connect group, you may even serve, but on the inside, you're somebody else. Your personal life, are you a citizen of a different kingdom than you are in public? Do you speak to God outside of meals and Sunday mornings? Do you even think of him at all during your week? Do you reflect on him all? Do you ask yourself questions like, what should I do because I'm a follower of Christ? Or do you just do whatever feels right? Do you worship with your life? Or do you only worship when people are looking at your life? You know what happened to Martin and Mitchell? Martin actually sought repatriation. He sought to come back home. And in 1979, the United States revoked his citizenship. And he died of cancer in Mexico. Obviously regretting the fact that he had left. Mitchell we know less about, but we know that he became an alcoholic and we know that he regretted his decision. And I believe he died in the Soviet Union as well. They wanted to come home. You see, this is what happens when you defect to the enemy, when you start believing Satan's lies. It all sounds good. It sounds like the grass is greener. And then guess what happens? You get surrounded by your stuff, your idols, the things that you thought were going to make you feel good, and you wake up one day and you realize what Martin and Mitchell realized as well. I want to go home. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. The grass isn't greener. And praise God, we are not like Martin and Mitchell because we can go home. Because there is a man named Jesus Christ, and he was offered the chance to defect. In the wilderness, in Luke chapter 4, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, both times, Satan comes to him and gives him the temptation. Hey, you don't have to go through with this. You can be your own God. You can be your own master. You don't have to do this. There's another way. And he resists the temptation to defect. He resists the temptation to desert God's plan. And you know why he resists it? One, he loves his Father in heaven, but two, he loves you. He wants you as a part of the kingdom because he knows the only way for you to come back, the only way for you to become a citizen of the kingdom is for him to go through it. And so whenever you join, whenever you become a citizen of another country, you know what you have to do? You have to take an oath. You have to swear to certain things you've got to uphold. Well, in order for you to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you know what you have to do? Just believe that Jesus took the oath for you. Just believe that he, 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 all the, the penalties of being a deserter, of being a defector, no longer apply to you. And his death, his burial, his resurrection, that pays the penalty. You're good to go. You just have to believe that, trust that. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to earn anything. You don't have to buy anything. You just got to trust him in your heart, not with just your external actions. Stop being a double agent. Come home. You can come home to Christ. Maybe that's what this 4th of July will be for you. The day that you declared your own independence. You began to follow Christ. So deceit leads to desertion. It leads to defection. It also leads to disease. Look at verse 3. Who forbid marriage, these are the false teachers, they forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So in the Civil War, 660,000 soldiers died. Of those 660,000, nearly two-thirds died from disease. Disease like malaria, typhoid, dysentery. Imagine going through four years of civil war as a soldier. You survive bullets, 
bayonet charges, cannon blasts, only to die in your tent because you drank water that somebody used the bathroom in a few miles up the stream. And you have no idea how you got sick. That's what happened to so many soldiers. You see, disease for the longest time was really the thing that killed armies more than anything else. And in verse 3, Paul talks about a disease that has infected the Ephesian church. It started to work its way through. Now, we don't know the specifics of the false teaching, but we do know that part of it was this asceticism, this idea that you give up certain things and you can be closer to God. You can be accepted by God. So it's saying here in the passage, you give up marriage and you give up eating certain foods. There's a problem with this teaching, though. You know what the problem is? The false teachers are calling something good or calling something evil that God has called good. That's a problem. Because in Genesis, God creates food and makes it good for eating. He creates marriage and says it's good. And then these guys are coming in behind him and saying, no, 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 no. Those are actually bad things. This is the way that disease and duplicity really get a hold of our lives. When you start really believing falsehoods, you start calling that which is evil, you start calling it good. And that which is good, you start calling it evil. And this is where you feel this tension, this paradox taking place. Because just because some things are good, like marriage or sex or eating, doesn't mean they're good without restriction. The Bible gives us plenty of restrictions on how to go about these things. I can't go to Whataburger or a diner and be like Ron Swanson and say, I'll take all the eggs and bacon that you have. I want to. But that's not good for me. Sex is intended for marriage. There's restrictions on it. God is providing guidance over these things. And so initially, disease brought on by duplicity looks like compromise. I'll look at this one thing on the internet. Nobody's going to get hurt. It's okay to turn a blind eye to this suffering. It's okay. It's okay if I continue to, to miss church. I'll, I'll watch it on, on replay later on in the week. And then you don't. And then it advances. And stage four duplicity is just lethal. It's terminal. You start affirming things that Scripture clearly does not affirm. You do exegetical gymnastics to prove your points. You only listen to people uh, that agree with you. You refuse to listen to anybody else. You only listen to one source of news, and you think everybody else is lying. And when you get to that point, when you're at stage four duplicity, here we go. So no one can help you. The only hope you have is for Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God to take a hammer and chisel to that piece of rock you call a heart. That's the only hope you have. Because when you're stage four believing lies, there's not much you can do to get out of it. I hope that if that is you today, maybe that was the first strike of a chisel. And maybe, maybe, the Lord's going to do something new in your life today. So how do we combat this? How do we fight it? Well, let's talk about the power of integrity. There's a military term. It's called defeat in detail. It's also called divide and conquer. Basically, you break up another army into smaller pieces, and you try to defeat the, the smaller pieces in, to, to try and wear down this army, right? One of the most famous examples of defeat in detail happened at the Little Bighorn. George Armstrong Custer, 2,500 Native Americans versus about 270 cavalry soldiers. You, if you don't know where this is going, it's not good for the cavalry. Com, uh, Custer compounds his issue by dividing his army up into not two, not three, but four pieces. And they can't help each other. And they're slaughtered to the man. And I bring this up because of the word integrity. Integrity often means, right, honesty, right, person of integrity. But it also means to be whole. It means to be complete. Buildings have integrity, right? We want them to have integrity. And this is what's, how it's best, I think, to understand the term today. It means whole or undivided. Dishonesty is all about division. I'm going to be one way in front of people, and I'll be a different way at home. That's dishonesty. But integrity is being whole. I'm consistent the whole way across. And Paul addresses two strategies that we can do, that we can have integrity in our lives. The first is to have wholehearted gratitude. Look at verse 4. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Paul repeats again that importance of calling that which is good good, recognizing that that which is good comes from God. This is a really effective way to cut through the, the duplicity that leads to desertion and defection because you won't think that the grass is greener. When you realize that every good thing you have comes from God the Father, you're not going to want to go anywhere. Those things to go to, go to other parts of, of, 
the grass is greener doesn't apply to you anymore because you're like, man, I've got it so good here with the Lord. I don't need to go anywhere else. I don't need that. And I'm not talking about perfunctory gratitude or just kind of offering up random blessings every now and again. No, no, no. I'm talking about wholehearted gratitude. Everything you are giving thanks to God. So offer thanks. Offer thanks to him. At the same time, we see that every good thing is given to us by God. We also recognize that we want to know this God more. And this leads us to the second thing, wholehearted devotion. Verse 5, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Paul points to two things we talk about all the time in church, reading the Bible and praying, right? And it's through these two things we cultivate our relationship with God. It doesn't mean that we, uh, we, we make our relationship with God through these things, but we get to cultivate it. Spending time with the Lord in prayer and the scriptures are not optional. They're critical, critical things. We get to know God, and we get to know the Lord who's given us these gifts. We get to draw close to him and understand his intention for those gifts, and that's important too. When you get a gift, it's important to know, how does the giver intend for me to use this? At the same time that you're reading scripture, though, it's important for scripture to read you, and what I mean by that is, it's letting scripture tell you about yourself, and sometimes it's not always good. Sometimes you have to realize that, that you're missing the mark somewhere. Somewhere you have to believe, understand that you might be believing some lies. I listened to a Tim Keller sermon. Keller's the, the voice that we hear on the, the bumper video, and he was referencing a Martin Luther strategy of, of meditating on the scriptures, and it's an acronym. It's called TAX, T-A-C-S. And when you come to a passage of scripture, uh, the first thing you, you do is, is T. You, you acknowledge the truth that's in the passage. What is this passage saying? What's the truth here? Reflect on it. And then there's A, there's adoration. I'm going to give God praise for the good thing that he's presented to me today, this truth. And there's C, confession. How am I missing the mark? How am I not living my life in light of this truth and confessing to God? God, I, I missed the mark. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then there's supplication. Lord God, how can I, what, true, what out of this truth can I ask for? What can I request? And sometimes it's not about you. Sometimes you read about uh, uh, the saints and how persecution, and you're like, I need to pray for people across the world who are struggling, who don't have the freedom to worship like we have here. Here's the thing. Let the scriptures drive you to prayer and let your prayers drive you to the scriptures. They're supposed to be mutually reinforcing. They're supposed to have integrity. They're supposed to have integrity, prayer and the word of God. And at the same time, you need to be honest with God where you're at. If you're not going to be honest in your prayers to the Lord, guess what? You're never going to be honest with anybody else, including yourself. I want to address one more thing before we, we go, before we transition into communion. I want to focus on what it says here. It says, by the word of God. It's made holy by the word of God in prayer. Typically, when we read word of God, we think, oh, the Bible. But in John chapter 1, John calls Jesus the word of God. He calls Jesus the word of God. So when it says that something is made holy by the word of God, when I read that, I think to myself, my goodness. Like, what does it mean to make something holy? Because what, what happens is when Jesus Christ comes into our life, when we accepted him as our savior, all of a sudden, everything that we do becomes a sacred act. There is no more common things. There's no more common things in your life. So uh, 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 going to work is now an act of worship. Being with your family is an act of worship. Changing a diaper is an act of worship. Maybe the greatest you can do. And you might think to yourself, goodness, Travis, well, well you don't know what I'm like. You don't know who I am. You don't... Like, it seems like whenever I touch something, it just becomes foul. It's not the case. Because when Christ comes into your life, you have been made holy. You've been made righteous. And so now, everything you do is sacred. So we give God honor. We give God worship through what we do. Those things like the arts, our work, our families, our home life, it's sanctified. Turn to Christ in prayer. Offer up those things to him. And then you have integrity. You have integrity in your life, integrity in your worship. Everything that you're doing, the person that you present to the world outside, that's the person that I am inside. And you'll be like, well, Travis, what about if I'm doing it wrong? Well, then God will tell you about that. Offer and say, Lord, I might be doing this wrong. I might be working terribly. I might be a big fat jerk. Tell me. You know what God's really good at doing? He's good at letting you know. Our God is not malicious. He's not going to let you wander without giving you instruction. 
God takes common things, things like you and me, things like your job, things like your family, and he makes them holy. And you know how I know this? Because on the last night that Jesus was with us, he took two very common things, a piece of bread and a cup. And he made it some of the holiest things that we do.